Welcome everybody to this Wheeler Centre session with author Vikram Chandra. Uh, Vikram possesses a rare confluence of skills, writing and programming, and he's reflected and expanded upon both disciplines in his latest book, which is called Geek Sublime, Writing, Fiction and Coding Software. In it, he jumps back to almost two decades ago when he published his first novel, Red Earth and Pouring Rain, which was an epic story, bursting with liveliness, uh, rich with cultural insights. It won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best First Book, since then, Vikram's gone on to write the critically acclaimed works Love and Longing in Bombay and Sacred Games with the incisive and sexy Sataj Singh and his charming nemesis Ganesh uh, Gaitond. I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce any of these names correctly tonight, but please bear with me. Um, he will want to make you learn the grammatical rules of Sanskrit, read classical Tamil love poems and build logic gates out of Lego. Please join me in welcoming Vikram Chandra. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Vikram, I wondered uh, if you could expand upon something you've said before. You've said the brain is one huge pattern-recognising unit and um, described humans as pattern-seeking creatures. Do you think this tray is equally powerful in writing and programming? Yes, I, I do think so. Um, in fiction, what you're doing is usually, and especially when you start thinking about the genres of fiction, is working within a received form, as it were, right? So we all know how a story is supposed to be constructed. You, know, you have the first, uh, the first act, which introduces the conflict. You get the rising arc of conflict in the second act, and then you get the uh, climax and the resolution with a little drop-off. You know, you've all seen that triangle, I'm sure. So um, it's a pattern that has worked extremely well across cultures for thousands of years, which is why every Hollywood movie that you ever see is built in that exact structure. <clears throat> and there's variations. Uh, the Indian model for narrative is a bit different from that because it comes from a different uh, literary tradition where there's different theories of what a piece of fiction should do. Uh, but in any case, I think as an artist, you're always working with the tension between what the pattern wants you to do and you always want to twist it and change it. So to bring to the reader the surprise of being, of you alighting the pattern somehow, right? Without destroying it entirely. And then sometimes what artists do is invent new patterns altogether. But in that case, then you have to teach the reader what the pattern is. Um, so I, I often say that the detective story is probably the only really modern form in fiction, right? Because if you look at the classical and medieval world, you can find analogs for all the other kinds of stories. Um, coming of age, uh, the great journey across great dangers and so forth. But the detective is a post-enlightenment form, right? Who incarnates reason, uh, the scientific vision, the theorizing. So if you look at what I think is the first detective story is Edgar Allan Poe um, writing uh, the first Dupin story. And of course, I'm going to forget the name of it. Uh, does anybody remember? Uh, in any case, when he, when he tells that story, he, spends, he has to spend a couple, three pages first defining what ratiocination is, what a mystery is, and what a puzzle is, and what is the proper role of the detective in relation to the question in the fiction. And the reason he's doing it is that because nobody's ever done this before, so he's sort of instructing you in how to read the story that he then tells. And since then, that, that pattern has become so familiar to us that it now, at some point, patterns start feeling like cliches, at which point then you want to reconstruct them. So in Sacred Games, where you've got an element of the detective novel, right, the crime right. sort of thing, um, you've got quite an ambitious structure. You've got first and third person accounts. Right. You have intersections of um, historical kind of unravelings. Right. Uh, for you, do you design that structure first? or do uh, you No, no. Uh, I, I never know when I'm starting what the damn book is about. I usually <laughs> I have the vaguest idea. I have a character and sometimes I have a location. So for Sacred Games, I knew that there was this cop who was talking to a gangster who's barricaded himself inside this strange fortress-like house. And they're talking over the intercom. And I had no idea why these guys were there. And so once you start exploring, uh, uh, what I have to do is to follow then the characters, and then they show me where they want to go. And then um, through many iterations, right? Like So the first draft is always horribly incomplete and full of 
strands that have gone nowhere. And then you know you do revision 10, and then you do revision 20, and then slowly that structure emerges um, from this constant thing. And I suppose in, in that's one of the aspects of fiction writing which feels to me analogous to what one does in programming. Mm -hmm. The sort of iterative uh, effort to make small pieces that then you're fitting together, mm -hmm. composing them to make larger pieces. And you can't quite see the structure clearly at first, but it sort of, it's half built and half revealed to you as, as you go along constructing the solution to whatever problem that you're trying to uh, solve. Mm. As, as more of a programmer and definitely not a writer, that uh, really resonates with yeah, me. Yeah. Do you think that um, there's any sense of the muse for a programmer? <laughs> yeah, I suppose there must be. Who would she be? <laughs> Somebody mechanical. Oh, Ada Byron, Ada right? Would be yeah, great. Ada. Of course she's the muse. Right. Um, I, I mean, in, in similar ways to, I mean, what happens in fiction writing is that sometimes you reach a juncture in the story where you don't know what's going to happen next. And my time-tested solution for this is to go away, right? Walk away from the problem and then um, three days later while you're taking a shower, the solution pops fully made into your head as it were, is sort of presented to you. And I think that, that often happens in other kinds of technical uh, fields as well, that you, attacking the problem straight mm -hmm. on is not always the, the way to get to the solution. So when you program and when you write, is the zone the same? No, no, it's very different. So I, I should say for people who haven't read the book is that, that uh, my impulse, my first impulse, uh, I made my way through grad school um, getting paid to be a computer programmer. Uh, grad school as in graduate school for writing fiction. And after I published my first novel, I kept doing it because it's pleasurable. It, it's fun, and especially if you're doing it as a hobbyist, there are no delivery deadlines, nobody's breathing down your neck and asking for support, so it's just kind of fun to play with. Um, and so I've always wanted to write about the the sort of uh, kind of anthropology of computer programmers for non-programmers, like my wife, right, mm -hmm. whose eyes glaze over if you talk tech stuff to her. <laughs> so, uh, and, and with specific reference to programmers in America, and especially Silicon Valley. So that's where I started, but pretty soon it became clear to me that one way to approach this was to th try and think about how writers and programmers both deal with language. Right? We both sit there all day staring at a blank screen using language for certain purposes. But how are those similar and how are they different? Um, and it's interesting in that, that uh, if you talk to most artists, friends of mine who are painters and filmmakers, um, to them, programming is this esoteric discipline. It's very mystical. They have no idea of how, what programmers actually do, but it's full of money, apparently, and power, and, and you know, they like that. But coming in the other direction, there's a lot of programmers who would argue that they're very similar to artists, right? And the, the sort of ideal expression of this impulse was in a quite well-known essay written by the venture capitalist Paul Graham. Uh, which he called hackers and artists. And his assertion there was that because both hackers and uh, artists engage in these iterative processes and both care about elegance and clarity and expressiveness and beauty, what hackers do is just like what artists do. So it became, I suppose I started thinking about how far should we take this? Is that really true? And that's where the book starts, um, is by comparing the two mediums um, as mediums, not just of um, communication or solving problem, but of expression as well. Uh, so to get back to your mm -hmm. question of, after that long detour, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happens to me when I'm programming is that I, I kind of disappear into the puzzle. Right? There's a kind of ludic aspect to computer programming, which is, in, in its best moments, is so attractive because what you, the way that you build programs is you write very small um, components that do only one thing, right? So it all gets focused down to this little piece of code is going to do this one thing. And then you can write tests to see if it's actually doing that thing or not. And there's a green check mark that lights up on the screen when you've done it correctly. So there's a kind of instant feedback loop between doing and um, knowing whether you, you've succeeded or failed. And the problems come sort of sequentially, and then you're solving them sequentially. 
uh, and so hours can pass, and you, you have no sense of like you know how should you eat, should you get up and take a walk, all that goes away. Um, and so there's a Tom Christensen, Christensen um, a programmer, put it very nicely and succinctly. He said the computer is the game. Right? Um, so that there's a sense in which the handling the thing itself becomes the the fun part of it. Um, writing fiction, I think, for me at least, creates a very different state of consciousness um, in that uh, you're trying to imagine the story and let this take shape in you kind of three-dimensionally, right? So like I was saying, I have a character inside my head, I have a location, the gangster's house, now I'm trying to see what's happening next. And then they start doing something, so I'm trying to kind of take what I can see inside my head and move it to the page and make that scene palpable so that you can smell it and taste it like I do inside my head. But what that means is that I can't lose myself in the fiction itself that I'm creating. I have to be aware of the language that I'm using to construct that. And so I think what this does to a lot of writers is create a kind of split in the self. It, it, I, for me, it feels like the very opposite of flow. Right, and it's quite a cliche among writers, actually, um, that "quote unquote" writing is hell. Um, and I think it's for this reason that that you have an impulse to do it, and a very strong impulse to do it. You have to do it. It feels like a compulsion, but the actual doing of it is not a ludic thing at all. It doesn't feel like play. It feels like something else altogether. You don't forget to eat. Yeah, you yeah. don't forget to eat. In <laughs> fact, the fridge calls out to you. <laughs> <laughs> distractions, you know, it, yeah. So you've mentioned that um, something that writing and programming both have in common is ideas about elegance and style. Would you like to talk a little bit about sure. how those are quite different values in, in the different disciplines? Sure. So um, one of the things that uh, I think I wanted to get across with this book to people who are not programmers is the idea that programmers care about beauty. Now, why is this, right? Uh, so the answer is that, that normally one would think that a piece of code, a program, is a series of instructions issued to a machine, right? And the machine doesn't care about whether it's elegant or not. So, but uh, what you're writing, the, the, the sending instructions to the mas machine is only incidental. It's a kind of side effect. What you're really writing code for is to communicate with the programmer who will look at your code three years later and try and understand it and change it and fix bugs in it and add features to it, right? And so because of this, clarity, expressiveness, elegance, um, the, the code should make itself clear what it's trying to do um, so that the person can actually understand what it's trying to do. And if you don't do that, even reading your own code three months after you've written it, you can look at it and it looks like some sort of Egyptian hieroglyphics. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, so on, on the sentence by sentence level or the code line by code line level, that's what you're really thinking about is how to make this absolutely clear and how to state it in a way that is succinct yet, yet understandable. And then on a larger architectural level, um, what you're trying to do is create something out of these small components by fitting them together, but ideally, if you needed to replace one of these components and take it out and replace it with something else, you could do that easily. But that's not always the case. Um, what off, you often get is spaghetti code. Uh, that's the programmer's term for it, which is to say um, pieces of code that are so intertwined with each other and so closely connected with each other that you cannot take out one piece without changing the entire thing that sits next to it, which then, that change then rolls along to the next one and to the next one and to the next one, and then you end up with this unholy mess. What you think was a simple fix turns into this horrible, epic sort of trek through, through this jungle of code, right? Uh, so programmers call that kind of um, program a big ball of mud, right? And it's a big ball of mud because Nothing is clear in it. You don't, you're not sure how the connections are being made within the pieces of that code. So uh, Donald Knuth, who's a famous computer scientist and, and uh, uh, programmer, famously codified this into the notion of literate programming, 
right? So that what he said was that that programmers should sit down with a dictionary and a thesaurus next to them. So that what you're doing then is constructing self-contained little pieces of code that are very, very important, uh, very sort of um, clearly defined, and also as building blocks, they're also clearly defined. So, and I think it's for that reason that people like Paul Graham then um, start to think about what they're doing as a kind of uh, process that prizes clarity, elegance, you know, all of those things which add up together to make beauty. So, um, what, how, what do writers do? I think writers do something that's very different from that. Um, and in this way, and, and here I'm going to introduce some esoteric Sanskrit literary theory, which I do in the book also. Um, so the interesting thing about Sanskrit is that its central grammar um, is a book called the Ashtadhyayi, uh, literally means eight chapters, and we think it was written in about 500 BCE by a guy named Parnini. And what's interesting about this book is that it's not a conventional grammar, as you'd find for English or Hindi today. It's actually a rule set, which is to say it contains um, about 2,976 very tightly defined economically written rules. It has about a list of 2,000 verb roots, uh, a meta language, and some assorted bits and bobs that go along with all of this. And the way it works is like a machine. It's a word-producing machine. There's an Indian scholar who famously described it um, as an infinite word-producing device. So when you want to make a word, you take um, one of those roots, those verb roots, you put it into the system, as it were. That certain rule takes hold of that, changes that string in certain ways, transforms it, passes it on to the next rule. And so there's a clear order of rules. Sometimes rules can be recursive. Um, sometimes one rule can call another rule. And then finally, what pops out at the other end is a completely formed word or a sentence. All right. So it's a kind of astonishing thing. And, and it, it connects with the themes that we've been talking about in a couple of ways. One is that um, this grammar is discovered by uh, the West the, the, westerly, the West scholarly, Western scholarly tradition during the great flowering of Orientalist research in the 18th and 19th centuries. It gets translated. And so what happens is that people like Ferdinand de Saussure, the father of uh, structural linguistics, I don't know how many of you know this, but he was a Sanskrit professor, right? So this idea that you can use a set of formulae, linguistic formulae to generate language, becomes very important in modern linguistics, right? Uh, Alan Bloomfield, who was a great American linguist, um, also was a professor of Sanskrit. He taught Sanskrit himself. Again, his work is very influenced by this, these Parninian ideas. And that work, that linguistic work in linguistics itself, becomes then, um, in, the th in the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, the seedbed for the thinking about computer languages, right? Because what, what are you looking for when you're trying to say how a computer language should work? It has to be very tightly constrained by rules. It has to be formalized because you need to be able to parse it through a machine, right? So, I, uh, so formal languages then are languages that remain stable and are very tight because they're so tightly defined by a set of rules. So... Um, the other interesting effect that this has is on the Sanskrit language itself. Because it is so tightly constrained, it becomes, in practice, a formal language. Which is to say that unlike other languages which change over time, um, so for instance, if you were to go and try and read Beowulf, it reads very, you can sort of recognize it as something similar to what you and I speak, but it's very different. Sanskrit, you can go back 2,000 years and read something and make sense of it. Because it had this very tight formal grammar, it remained stable. Right? And so in India, it became uh, very much the basis for any kind of rational and philosophical and scientific thinking because it was thought of as an eternal language. This is the one language that never changes. So what, what happened was that apart from all this sort of philosophical and logical work that people were doing within um, this culture, people started to write poetry and plays and literature in it. 
And then the theoreticians within the language were faced by this problem. What is it about certain kinds of language that seems beautiful? What is it about poetic language that makes it different from non-poetic language, mundane language? And uh, the first impulse was to think about it very formally, right? So that they thought of language, poetic language, as language made beautiful by what they call adornment. So figures of speech, alliteration, right? All of those formal things that you could do to language to, in order to make it pretty, to sound good, right? Um, and then in the ninth century, this theorist named Anand Vardhana came along, and he had a whole new theory. And what he argued was that poetry is beautiful because of what it doesn't say. Right? It seems like a very odd statement. So what he does is he, he provides a whole sort of uh, theory of language, of poetic language and meaning, uh, and he does it by giving examples. So I'll just read to you this very short verses that he uses to demonstrate his points. So this is one. So the situation here is that uh, there's a great sage who has come to the king of the Himalayas to suggest that his daughter Parvati should be married to the god Shiva. Right? And the great sage is speaking to the king. And this is how the verse goes. While the divine sage was speaking to Parvati's father, she, eyes downcast, counted the petals of her toy lotus. Right? So an Anandvardhana's analysis of this is that because we see a young woman who suddenly is shy when there's talk of her marriage going on, we understand that what she's experiencing is love, right? She looks down and counts the petals of the toy lotus. So what he's saying is that the poet, without any sort of denotative effort, there's nothing in that sentence on the level of denotative meaning which tells us that she's shy and in love. It's all done through suggestion, right? And if any of you have taken a creative writing class, fiction class especially, this will have been drummed into your head, right? Show, don't tell, right? So this is the ninth century Indian version of that. They would have said, suggest, don't tell, right? Um, and so he goes on and expands this into... Um, um, the, the summary that I'm giving you is very sort of... Uh, it's very crude. I mean, he expands on it in a very sophisticated way, over hundreds of pages. And then this idea of suggestion, of the heart of poetry, the life of poetry, being that which is not said, becomes expanded into this whole theory of what they call dhwani. Dhwani literally is reverberation, vibration. So in this context, it is that which, when, which poetic language sets off within you. Right? So, suggest, so poetic language doesn't just work in a, in a, in a denotative way, it acts in a suggestive way. Right? And this suggestion can work at the, at the level of a word or a sentence or an entire work. Right? Um, so another example that he gives um, is this one. Uh, so the situation here is that uh, you'll all know something about the Ramayana, I'm guessing in which uh, Rama is the great king, his wife Sita or Vaidehi gets kidnapped by Ravan, um, the great sort of demon king. So this is the situation is that it's the monsoon, uh, it's the time when traditionally lovers come together in Indian, Indian erotic culture. So this is Rama speaking. Clouds smear the sky, flocks of crane tremble across their viscous blue-black beauty. The winds sprinkle rain. The peacocks call their soft cries of joy. Let all this be as it likes. I am Rama. I am hard-hearted. I can endure all. But Vaidehi, how will she survive? Alas, my goddess, be strong. Right? So what Anandvardhana says about this is, why is the word Rama in there? the reader already knows that the speaker is Rama, right? So it's, ad, it's not adding anything to the information that you already have. And what he suggests is that because the word Rama reverberates right there, it reveals to us as if in a flash of light all of those qualities about Rama that we know to be true, right? So we see his entire life before and after because of this suggestion, this verbal suggestion, right? Does that make sense? So, according to them, what 
what um, writers do is, is set up this kind of purposeful ambiguity through the use of language so that the surface of the, of the language carries within it this huge expanse of other things within it, feeling, of emotion, of ideas, of metaphors, right? And that is what we look for in great art, is that sense of reverberation, of endlessness, right? And so I guess in the, um, my first sort of great encounter with somebody, obviously, who wrote, wrote like this is Hemingway, right? And Hemingway's um, uh, literary fortunes have waxed and waned in the years since he died. But if you read him at his best, I think what he does with language is an astonishing example of precisely what these guys are talking about. Right? It's very simple, very clear words, but somehow within those words is contained an entire universe of emotion. Right? So One thing that struck me about this um, Pratyabhinan, uh, sorry if I'm mangling yeah, yeah. that, but the philosophy um, yeah. is that not, are they, not only are they talking about the infinite, but they're talking about the void, which right. uh, comes back to the programming side of things, you know, the zeros and the ones, uh, right, right. and um, how you have to represent the whole world with only zeros and ones. Uh, right, right. And if you have never understood machine code and actually how your computer runs, there's a fabulous explanation of it in this book, um, and uh, I don't think I've read a, a better explanation oh, of that. You. But I wonder... That's, um, that's very pleasing. I mean, I, I, you know, what happens often with books about computers for the general reader is that at some point they'll say, well, there are computer languages, and then there's a great deal of hand-waving. Somehow binary numbers, something happens to them down there, and, and somehow computation then comes about. And I didn't want to do that, so I made a big effort to try and sort of actually follow the languages the layers of language down to the machine, as it were. And my big audience was my wife. I was like, Melanie, do you understand this now? <laughs> you... and, and also because I worked as a computer professional for many years without having the slightest idea how computers actually worked. <laughs> right? Because what you're dealing with is at a very high language level, it's a conceptual universe, right? There's a series of metaphors, windows, um, menus, uh, desktop. And you can manipulate th those by handling your language. But you don't need to know, or at least you don't need to know in an urgent way, anything about what goes on under, the, under that. So I finally learned very late, so I wanted to make sure that it was in the book. That's right, because mm -hmm. if we grew up watching The Matrix, then yeah. we have a really <laughs> yes. flawed idea about how programmers get things done. Right. Um, but with, within that philosophy, um, with the, the infinite and the void and the zeros and ones, do you think that zeros and ones creating a whole universe, is that what entrances writers and programmers in the same way about uh, maybe it. the potential of, um, of, the, of what they're working with? That's really interesting. Um, so the, uh, the void that, that you're, she's talking about um, refers to certain philosophical, metaphysical ideas actually, that, that, that some of these philosophers then work with. Um, so, uh, what I also wanted, didn't want to do was that we often talk about um, both technology and aesthetics as if they're suspended somewhere above the earth, right? That they're free of politics, they're free of everything else. It's supposed to be a politics-free zone. And I think both of those things are very much attached to our daily lives, the way that we think about the world. So I, was, I tried to ground the discussion of computers and especially in gender politics and then also um, as it happens, um, the people that worked a lot on these Indian theories of poetic meaning uh, were off a certain bent. So there was Anand Vardhana who created this um, notion of poetic meaning being reverberation. The next great person to come along was this, a century later, was this guy called Abhinava Gupta. Um, polymath, brilliant metaphysician, musician, poet, um, logician, all kinds of brilliant things. And what he did was that he took the earlier Dhwani reverberation theory and he attached it to memory. So his argument was that when you and I are watching Games of Thrones, uh, Game of Thrones, if we see somebody getting killed on stage, as it were, why don't we run screaming away from the television set, right? So his idea was that what happens in these sort of, in, in that context, in the artistic context, is that the, the, um, 
the action, the play, evokes in us the emotions of horror, right? Regret, grief. And where are these coming from? Well, he argued that all of us have within us what he called latent memories, trace memories, right? So that all the past that you've experienced until now in this life, and since it's India, all the past lives as well, they're all buried like sediment within you, right? So when you watch a piece of art, when you watch a play, those memories are brought alive again, except this time that they're not connected to your ego, to your sense of I. So you're able to feel emotion without being personally attached to it. And therefore then, you're able to actually enjoy the cognition of those emotions. Does that make sense? Right. So is that the same as the, the Rasa Dvani that you talk about? Right, exactly. Right. And can you tell us how um, T.S. Eliot might have been related to that concept? <laughs> yes. Well, so, okay, so there's... Abhinav Gupta does all this brilliant work with memory and how memory and its manipulation by the artist is an essential part of the aesthetic experience. And so uh, he extends this to say that the pleasure that we feel during an aesthetic experience is exactly the same pleasure that the yogi experiences, right? In other words, it, art is a kind of popular meditation which is very easy to engage in. All of us, when we watch Game of Thrones, enter into a meditative state, right? According to these guys. What happens is that your personal self recedes, right? And you experience all these emotions which are yours but are not attached to your ego. And the object shines forth, right? So if you, if you, if you see somebody watching a film that they really like, you'll see the sense of absolute concentration, right? So what Abhinav Gupta says is that, that's meditation. But it's a meditation you don't have to spend years learning. It just comes to you like this. Right? And so the bliss of the, uh, of the aesthetic experience is the same as the bliss of the yogic experience. And as it turns out, um, Abhinav Gupta turns out to be one of the most famous and influential tantric practitioners of his time and ever after. Right? And you all have heard of Tantra, like esoteric practices and so forth. So I don't want to get lost in that, but finally there's this idea in, in his version of Tantra, this notion of how the universe is created is um, it starts from consciousness. Right? So there's this primordial consciousness, and then there's a vibration inside that primordial consciousness, and first there is the foregrounding of its fullness, and then there is the void. And the void is self-reference, right? self-awareness. And from that first separation into fullness and void, that one and zero, which is what you're talking about, all the phenomenal universe kind of unfolds from that. I, I know, this is like, it's weird. Mystic. So the vibrating, we know he's a string theorist. He's there. a string theorist, yes. yeah, exactly, yeah. right. So, so it's very tempting then to, to sort of put that next to the one and zero of, of computer code and, you know, even in a larger sense, um, the work that some people are doing in thinking about the universe itself as an information system, right, uh, in which the, the universe is computing itself, right? Uh, so, so I... I Programmers sort of, never have big egos. Yeah, yeah. So I just, I just wanted, I mean, I'm, I'm not making that kind of... Leap. <laughs> Leap at all. I should caution you to say that I, I'm not doing that kind of thing that, you know, these guys knew all about science way back then. They were not scientists. They were, they were thinkers. They were philosophers of language. But, but in a poetic way, it was, became a lot of fun to take these ideas from, like, long ago and a very different place and then put it next to the ones and zeros of computer programming. Mm. In a moment, we're going to ask for questions from you guys. But um, before we do that... I wanted to say I really enjoyed uh, learning so much about Indian culture and um, literary theory, linguistic theory, that sort of thing, from a very different perspective while reading this book. I, I've noticed that dharma or you know duty features a lot throughout your works, nonfiction, fiction. Right, right. I wondered if um, if you felt any sense of duty writing this, and and if that might have been you know duty to country to to explore your culture <laughs> a bit or did any of that come through right dharma um as i'm sure all of you know it's usually translated as duty it's something um 
it's what you must do in the world, your job in the world, more or less. So I, I guess here my first impulse was to explain my obsession to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I spent all this time thinking about and playing with. And then, yes, I do. I, I suppose for me, um, it was my version of the two cultures problem, right? The scientific culture and the poetic culture. And sort of... Um, uh, explain the two to each other, right? Or at least put the put the two together in a way that would make uh, a kind of illustrative sense, right? Uh, and it was great fun. I mean, and I, I should say that that I feel like, I, in some sense, I'm a popularizer, right? Uh, when I say I'm a programmer, I should also sort of say that I'm not a very good programmer. <laughs> I, was very, I was a journeyman programmer making good money because I, you know, I did database systems for small companies. I wasn't one of these wizards like, you know, who's reinventing the world or anything like that. And my knowledge of these Indian aesthetic theories are, again, the knowledge of an amateur. Right. Uh, I, I've now, in my late... Um, as I'm getting old, I'm trying to teach myself Sanskrit, but... Uh, and it's going very slowly. But uh, I certainly don't have a vast knowledge of that either. So, uh, and this is what novelists always do, right? You need little pieces of various kinds of knowledge in order to fake it in a novel, right? <laughs> <laughs> you just put together some pieces and some likely sounding jargon, and it like comes alive, and you know, the reader believes that you know about this thing. So th that's the kind of knowledge I have. So I thought, I, I felt my role was a kind of, yeah, a popularization of a popular explanation of both of these domains. So one last question. Um, you've been known to interview some very interesting characters for some of your books, you know, some Indian gangsters. And <laughs> that sounds very exciting. Did you interview anyone in yes. the build-up to this? Yeah, uh, some uh, programmers in India, programmers in the United States, a couple of people at Google. And, you know, I live in Oakland, just outside of San Francisco, and it really is an industry town. So, like, you know, some of the fathers and mothers at my daughter's schools are tech people. So it's hard to, like, sort of exist in that world without constantly being aware of not just the technical aspects of it, but how it works kind of in a, in a social way, right? Yeah. All right, I think it's time to open up for some questions. We have a mic over here and over here. Because the seats are quite low, if you could maybe make your way to um, our lovely attendants with their microphones, that would be very helpful. Thank you. I think we're our first cab off the rank. Thank you. I've actually got three questions. One is about Sanskrit, and I'm wondering, I um, found what you were saying about Sanskrit very interesting, and I actually studied Sanskrit many years ago at Melbourne University mm -hmm. for a, about a year. Um, but I'm wondering... What you said about Sanskrit and the grammar being a very systematic language, is it sort of a wild generalisation or is it some, there's some truth to sort of suggesting that that explains the large number of Indians who work in IT, both in India and the US? That's the first question. The second question is, um, is your book fiction or non-fiction? And the third question is, when you're talking about the reverberation and the name Rama, it made me wonder about the, in Sacred Games, the character Ganesh Gaitonda, mm -hmm. and the reverberations of Ganesh, yes. of course, are very different from the yeah. character, and how do you explain that contradiction? All right, all right. Well, I, very good question, and to start from the last one, uh, absolutely, right? So all writers know naming is really important, right? And sometimes you wait for a good name to come to you, and it just doesn't, but I knew Ganesh was Ganesh right from the start for the obvious reasons, right? Ganesh the god is the god of um, uh, beginnings. He's, uh, he's the patron god of poets and thieves. <laughs> and and uh, his, his, tea, his uh, vahan, uh, meaning the, the animal that he rides on, is the rat, right? The ultimate survivor. So for all of those reasons, it made perfect sense. Of course he had to be Ganesh, right? To give you that sort of echo of all those other meanings. Um, Wait, and then what was it's, this? It's non-fiction. It, it is absolutely non-fiction. I hope, I hope. Everything is, I tightly try to footnote every last thing. Um, and then um, in reference to Sanskrit, um, I, I'm wary of making some kind of, uh, to use a little bit of academic lingo, some kind of essentialist argument that Indians are good at language, right? Uh, uh, but 
Language certainly has been something of central concern to the culture right from the very beginning, right? So why does Parnini write the Ashtyadhyayi? The reason is that a thousand years before him, uh, or a thousand or more years before him, uh, was the, well, the first instances of text that we know in Sanskrit are the Vedas, right? And so the earliest of those roughly dating to somewhere between 2000 and 1500 BCE. And the important thing about the Vedas is that you're supposed to, uh, an educated person, especially a Brahmin, was supposed to know these. But it wasn't just the words that you were supposed to know. You, would, you had to know the rhythm. You had to know the, the, the tone of a certain word. And if something drifted in that, right, over generations, it was thought to be corrupted, right? So the sound of the language and the content of the language were equally important. Therefore, then, people developed this whole regime of linguistic sciences in order to keep the Veda uncorrupted, as it were. And out of that comes Parnini, who then does this, this sort of formalizing of the Sanskrit grammar. Um, and then his model of knowledge, right, the, the setting up of, like, what he's trying to do is describe a system. This is how the system of Sanskrit works. That model becomes the model for all knowledge in the Indian tradition. So everyone who's thinking about anything, right, anybody who's writing a Shastra, a scientific work, will try and do this kind of systematic description of a system, right? So, which is why, I don't know if any of you have ever read any of these texts, like, so the aesthetic texts have these endless listings of emotions and the gates that a character can use. All of that is, in, in, an, in a sense, an attempt to sort of capture the systematic whole, as it were. And if you look at the, the six major schools of Indian philosophy, the first thing that all of them do is to provide a model or a theory of meaning and language. Right? So the first thing you do is you say, this is what I think language is, this is how I think meaning emerges from language, and this is how I think um, we can establish the truth in the world through language, and then you go on and construct your whole entire other theory about reincarnation, karma, whatever you want to do. So language has been a very central concern right from the start. Um, and I think in terms of, I suppose, the, 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 what's happened in the last um, half century, uh, I'm not sure I would connect that necessarily to this language thing, except in that after independence, there was this very sort of, um, I would say, a very strange but visionary decision taken to pour huge amounts of money into the Indian Institutes of Technology, right? So, I mean, it was a very poor country. The industry had been completely destroyed. Um, there was, the agriculture was damaged. There was, you know, people would have said, build, build tractors, right? Why are you trying to set up this high-level knowledge-producing engineering institutes in your country? But they did it. And so what that meant was that when the 1980s and 90s arrived, India already had a cutter of engineers who could take advantage of that, right? And I suppose that sense of urgency in setting up the institutes in 1950 came from this sort of respect for higher learning, right? That you can't just concentrate, even though you don't have very much money, on the sort of basics, as it were. You also have to operate at these other levels, um, the cutting edge levels. Um, and I think that that was a happy coincidence that that happened. Thank you. Oh. Hi. Um, I've relatively recently gotten into creative writing, developed an interest in creative writing. So I'm curious about your relationship to your stories. When you finish a book, do you feel you've finished that story and developed the characters as much as you can? Can you close that off and say, yes, that's a completed piece of work? Or do you feel like, oh, I could have evolved that character more? It varies. Uh, you know, like, so... Um my last book was this big novel about gangsters and policemen in Bombay. Um, but that policeman who's the protagonist, Sartaj Singh, had actually appeared in a book before that, um, um, in a collection of short stories, and, and he was the cop in one of these police procedural stories. And when I finished that book, Levin Long in Bombay, I was convinced that I was all done. Right? Never see these people again, thank God, I've spent like four years <laughs> with them. Right? 
And then what happened was that I was walking around Bombay and I would still notice something and I would find myself imagining it through Sartaj. Right? And it bothered me. I'm like, what the hell are you still doing inside my head? I, I want you to leave. And then it slowly became apparent that, that the reason he was still in my head was because I needed, we had kind of unfinished business and then that turned out to be a 900 page novel. And now I think I'm finally done with him. I hope, I hope <laughs> that I'm done with him. Um, so yes, usually you can sort of leave it behind, although uh, it does happen that you keep writing until they drag it from your fingers, right? <laughs> Because there's always one more word you could change to make it better. But when it's done, it's done, right? And, and often what's odd is that, you know, uh, when you do these kinds of conversations, people will talk to you about your work because they've read it just last week and to them it's all fresh and alive. And to you, it's this thing that existed 20 years ago and it's like kind of getting hazy a little <laughs> bit. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it does get, some of it does go away. Yes, sure. um, could you ever give away your computer programming job and immerse yourself in writing full time or does the programming add something to your writing as well? Well, I think now it functions for me as release. Right? Because I think when, when you're writing fiction or poetry, I suppose, you, you're dealing with ambiguity all the time. Right? Ambiguity on several levels. One is, is the work that you're doing today, the sentence that you just wrote, is it any good? Right? And what happens in code is that, that success is very clearly defined. Right? You write a little snippet, you write a function, and it's supposed to do one thing. Right? So you write the function, then you write a few tests to test it under various conditions, and then that green lights, check marks light up across your screen, and you're, yeah, that's done. And so there's an instant feedback loop. But with fiction, you're writing for an imagined viewer, an imagined reader. And that reader might actually be 100 years in your future, right, after you're dead. So there's no sense in which you can grasp securely whether what you're doing is any good or not, right? Um, and then also because you're trying to do these kind of, create these purposeful reverberations, ambiguities, uh, beyond denotation and beyond connotation, you're dealing in all the hazy areas that surround language, right? So to emerge from a day of that into the determinism of code, it feels like a holiday. It's really, it's like fun, right? And I suppose for me, it's like some version of what Some people have model trains, and some people go out and work in the garden, and I like to geek out and write a couple of lines of code. I know it seems really strange, maybe, but, but it, it just is the opposite from what I do normally. But writing is first, and, and really the compulsion. I, I, I mean, that's what I do, that's what I am. So I, I don't think that's going anywhere. Thank you. No one else at the moment? Maybe uh, you can cogitate a little bit. I wondered, um, you teach writing. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people these days talk about the importance of IT literacy. Where do you stand on the idea of um, basic coding literacy and, and what might, you know, do you think there's anything useful there that might be taught en masse, um, say at primary school levels or whatever? Or sure. Well, I, I think it's, it's certainly such a part of our world that I think, um, Just in the sense of cultural literacy, one might want to have a general understanding of how algorithms work, of how what you put into a, a screen gets converted into actual action somewhere else, that, that it's actually a physical thing that's happening somewhere else. Now, to do that, I don't think you have to turn you know, sixth graders into Steve Wozniak. <laughs> and, and not that you're going to be able to do that anyway, right? So I think it's enough if you present um, the opportunity to come close to code and to play with it. The guys who are going to be Woz will dive into it anyway, the, and the girls, they will, they will be attracted to it. But I think making the opportunity present there is, is a good thing. The trouble, I think, is that that Programming is still insanely hard. And a lot of it is hard because it's, it's, it's not hard in terms of the problem that you're dealing with is hard. All the ceremony that surrounds the thinking, that's the hard part, right? So in other words, um, you know, my six-year-old 
now is writing, making little books, right? Because both her parents are writers, so I guess it's like the thing that she does. But she's writing little comic books that start and they have a middle and they have an end, right? So with a pencil, she's able to create a whole world, a whole object that she recognizes is analogous to that which the big, the grown-ups do, right? But if you if you if you hand a six-year-old a laptop and tell them to write code, <laughs> there's no way they're going to be able to do that, right? I mean, they're going to have to learn about IDEs, they're going to have to learn about APIs, and, you know, it's, there's like thousands of little pieces that have to come together in order to give the opportunity for somebody to do something useful, right? And so I think because of this, what happens is a lot of the programming courses that get taught, and especially, I mean, I remember the one that I took two programming courses as an undergraduate, and I thought they were stunningly boring and useless. Because what they had me doing in those classes, and this was Pascal back in the day, you know, take this array of words and sort it, right? Uh, yeah, okay, now I can sort an array of words. So what? What do I do with this? What connection does it have with my life? So I, I think if you could give a kid um, a, a language and a system that would allow the kid to do something useful and something palpable in the world, there would be a feedback, and then they would see that there is a sort of sense to this that, that actually works out. But I think we're still far from the day when, when the tools become like pencils, right? And, and the, one of the, the essays by a programmer that I um, quoted um, very early in the book, it's a 1970-something essay by a very famous computer scientist named Butler Lampson. And the title of the essay is Programmers as Authors. And what he argued was that at the point that he's writing the essay, the profession of the programmer is closer to that of an aircraft designer in terms of all the overhead and the money that it requires than it is to a writer writing a piece of poetry. But his prediction was that at some point, because of the increasing um, sort of technological uh, advances and lowering costs, um, ordinary people, he says, will dash off programs like they, they write with, like, as if they're writing them with a pencil, and they will sell them. Right? So this is 50 years ago that he's thinking about this. Uh, it's not happened yet, and I don't think we're anywhere close to it. And I think that's the sort of, the, the, the gap is between, um, it's not just the teaching, it's the tools that you can offer for the teaching that I don't think are anywhere near um, functionality yet. That's very interesting. Well, everybody, thank you for your time tonight. The book is Geek Sublime, Writing Fiction, Coding Software. Um, Vikram has been amazing. Please join me in thanking him. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I, I bet you never thought you'd leave here tonight feeling so justified watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> Enjoy your meditation. Right. Good night. Right.